turn your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9, reads as follows. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. Father God, we ask for your guidance this morning. We ask that you would teach our hearts. As we open your word, as we study these words from Holy Scripture, we ask that you would guide us deeper into the life of Christ. That we would be more and more transformed into his image. That you would be glorified and we would waste away to nothing. That he would shine through in all of our actions and everything that we do and say. That we would be less and he would become greater. In Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, the last time I had the opportunity to preach to you guys, we were in 1 Peter, the beginning of chapter 2. And we looked at the passage right before this where we have uh, a contrast. Our text today begins with the word, but. And so whenever we have a text that begins with a but, we've always got to look backwards to see what we're comparing to, right? Uh, and so the contrast that comes before it shows us that there is dishonor and there is stumbling that comes when someone does not believe in Jesus Christ. That's what verse 8 declares, right? And that's what we have here in verse 8. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But for the grace of God, that would have been me. That would have been you. We're destined to remain in darkness. But, but the grace of God shows up here. So this but is here to give us hope. It's here to give us hope and not a hope in ourselves, but a hope in what God has done for us. So Peter launches directly in here after he has declared what could have been. And he declares who you are in Christ, what your identity is in Christ. And I want you to notice that each of these that we're going to look at this morning, there's five of them. Five things that we are in Christ that Peter declares. All of them are collective. And so as we, as we listen, we, we have a tendency in our day to think of everything individually. We want our single serve packages, we want things on our own, they're, they're by ourselves. But this is a collective idea. That we are the body of Christ. That we as the church of God. That we as those who have trusted in Christ Jesus are together a holy nation. A kingdom of priests. We are all of these things together. We are them individually as well. But as we look at it, he is speaking to this as a group. And so I want us to uh, understand this together as a group. And I, I hope you'll memorize this. Because it's a powerful, powerful verse here to declare who you are in Christ and, and to be able to leave that as an anchor in your mind and to know this is who I am. This is what I have become in Christ. He has made me these things. And so we're going to look at these this morning. You have a new identity in Christ and we saw that identity last time that we were here as being living stones built up into a, a holy temple for the Holy Spirit, right? That was where we were last time. We were living stones if we choose to have Christ as our cornerstone and we don't stumble over him. But in this passage, Peter is going to lean into the history of the Jews a little bit. Uh, and he's going to use some key phrases to identify those who believe in Christ. And if you've read your Old Testament, you should pick up on these images. You should hear these phrases that Peter uses to declare who you are in Christ. Because they are echoes of the promises that were made to the people of Israel. And so you should hear them as you go through. So let's look at them one at a time. And make sure you have your Bible ready. Because we are going to be flipping around to the Old Testament and seeing where these things show up. Uh, as he is clearly referencing some Old Testament passages. Right, first, Peter begins their identification with a, a, a stark contrast, as we've already said. Those that stumble and disobey the word were destined to do so. But there's a big but right there. But you are a chosen race. You are a chosen race. 
destined to stumble and disobey, but you are God's chosen people, is what he said. I can imagine the tension in the room that might have been there as Peter, uh, Peter's words were read out to this church, these people that were there. Uh, surely there was some Jewish person in the audience who went, um, there, God's chosen people? Wait a second, I, I thought that Israel was God's chosen people. But, I mean, what, what, what's going on here? Did, has God changed his chosen people? And, and that person wouldn't be wrong. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 10. Verses 14 and 15. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, this is Moses speaking to the people of Israel right before they get ready to go into the land of Canaan. Uh, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, he's declaring the law to them yet again. And he says, beginning in verse 14, Behold, the Lord your God, to whom belong heaven and the heavens of heaven, the earth and all that is in it. Yet the Lord has set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them. You above all peoples as you are this day. And so I can hear the objection. Has God changed his mind? Uh, why now are Christians referred to as a chosen race and not Israel? Has he changed his chosen people? Did, did Abraham, uh, was, did God call Abraham and, and promise to make his offspring into a great nation? And choose them for himself only to forsake them thousands of years later? That's a, a valid objection. But no, no, God has not forsaken Israel. Yet, Israel has forsaken God. Many, many times over, countless times over. We saw it in our text this morning in our reading in Jeremiah. God has not changed his chosen people, but they have forsaken him. He cared for them, he provided good for them, and they turned aside to other gods. They behaved just like the nations that were around them. And God warned them over and over again through the prophets who they killed. And he eventually led them in exile away from the land that he had given them. Because you see... God had no intention of simply adopting an earthly kingdom and an earthly family. That wasn't God's intention in choosing the people of Israel. Being God's chosen people didn't mean that he liked them better and that he would simply approve of all the things that they did. He is holy. God is a holy God and those who would not trust him, those who would continue to sin despite his warnings, were cut off, Paul says in Romans chapter 9. But the root of God's promise to Abraham remains. The root remains that in Abraham's offspring, in his offspring, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That promise remains. So the question is, who is Abraham's offspring? Who is Abraham's offspring? Well, Paul deals with that question in Galatians chapter 3. We read it a few weeks ago. Look at verse 16 of Galatians chapter 3. There Paul says, Now the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. And this is Paul giving clarification here. He says, It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. Paul's words. So who is Abraham's offspring? It's Christ. He is the son of Abraham who the promise was given to. Then down in verses 27 to 29 of Galatians chapter 3, he gives even more clarification. And he says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So Abraham's offspring is Christ, and we have put on Christ through baptism and belief. There is neither Jew nor Greek, Paul says. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. You are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. What a, what a beautiful picture there. That, that's exactly what Peter is getting at here he doesn't get into all the explanation like Paul does. He simply says, you're a chosen race. He blesses them with that and states it. Paul, being the analytical mind that he is, says, oh, I've got to answer this objection and go. Peter just jumps right in. He's just like, here you go. Here's the blessings that belong to Israel. They're now yours in Christ. Christ was the only 
perfectly faithful physical offspring of Abraham. He is the way, the truth, the life. He's the gate which we must enter for eternal life. And if you're in Christ, then you are God's chosen people. Peter doesn't mess around with all the explanation. He simply says, in Christ, you are a chosen race. God's chosen people. Heirs to the promise because you have been grafted into the root, which is Jesus Christ. So that's where he starts. And, and this choosing, this being a chosen race, this isn't our doing. It's not because we're better than others. It's, it's not because he knew that we would choose to respond to him. This choosing is a work totally of the grace of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 through verse 6 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Christ Jesus in, according with, in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Notice that there's nothing of our doing there. None of it is of our doing. It is freely a gift of his grace. This choosing is all to the praise of his glorious grace, his unmerited favor. Imagine how important it would have been for these Christians to hear this as they were deemed to be scum of the earth by the world that was surrounding them. As they were being persecuted. They were being treated as refuse. But here they see that though they are rejected by the world, they are chosen by God. What a picture. What a picture that he gives. But our identity doesn't just stop there with being a chosen race. He continues on with, with Paul, with, with Peter, the hits keep on coming. He just, one right after the other. Amen's raining down as he continues to say these things. So next, he tells them that they are a royal priesthood. Now that, that's a very particular choice of words there. A royal priesthood. And it's kind of easy for us to miss it. Because we've heard this so many times. We've heard this, it just kind of rolls off the tongue and, and we get the picture. But... To the person steeped in the Old Testament, to, to a Jew who would have been listening to this, it would have been jarring to hear that we are a royal priesthood. Why? Why? That was never something that the Jews were declared to be. Israel was never declared to be a royal priesthood. They were said to be a kingdom of priests. That's as close as we ever get in the Old Testament. That's in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6. It says that you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. But for the Jewish mind, the two realms, the two areas of royal, the king, and priesthood, the priests, are very separate. Okay. They're separated. In the Old Testament, the monarchy and the priesthood were strictly separated. The priest came from the line, the lineage of Levi and of Aaron, right? The Aaronic priesthood. And only the priests could approach God in his temple, and, and only they could offer sacrifices. The rest of the kingdom, the rest of the Jews, could not. In addition, the king was special in Israel because he was anointed by the priest with oil. He was equipped and empowered by God to do the tasks of ruling Israel and of doing battles for the Lord. And they're very distinct. They're separate. And we, are, we see that the king is to come from the line of Judah. All right? So you've got... Levi on one side and Judah on the other. Neither the two shall meet, right? They're separated. And we see this strict separation in the two roles when we see Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 13. And he's the king and he is wanting to go into battle. He's wanting to rush off into battle. And he doesn't want to wait for the priest Samuel to come to offer sacrifice. And so he decides to just do it himself. He decides to do it himself. And God told him that because of that, he was going to take away the kingdom from him and give it to a person who was after his own heart. A king who would be after his own heart to rule. Saul was judged very harshly for trying to bring these two realms into one. And so what is Peter doing here? What's Peter doing here combining these two lines into one? A royal priesthood. How does that work? How's that possible? only possible in the New Covenant. In the New Covenant, we see the author of Hebrews argue 
in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 17, that in the new covenant, Christ, Christ who is our high priest, comes from the order of Melchizedek. Comes from the order of Melchizedek, who was a former king and priest of the place called Salem, Jerusalem. That's the argument here, that, that in the new covenant, there's no longer a priest who must come from a specific tribal line. Rather, Christ is our high priest. With this ancient line that predates even the, the priesthood of Aaron, it was pointing to something prophesied about the Messiah. This is, uh, this is in Psalm chapter 110, verse 4. Psalm 110, verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, so we see this bringing in of the Messiah saying that he will be a king and a priest, one like Melchizedek, who was a king and priest, a kingly priest. But Peter isn't talking here about Jesus, right? He says, you are a royal priesthood. What he's doing there, when Peter says that Christians are a royal priesthood, he's alluding to the idea that we are united with Christ. We are in Christ for salvation. And so if we are his body, if we are in him, then whatever glory goes to Christ, we receive as well. Romans chapter 8 <laughs> refers to this. Romans chapter 8, Paul calls us heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ Jesus. That means that we will reign with him eternally. And here on earth, we have a priestly role to lead others in worship. That's our, that's our job. That's our duty. That's what we have been signed up for as we have become in Christ. Now, this aspect of our faith doesn't get explored a lot. You don't hear a whole lot of sermons about you being a king, you reigning with Christ. But we're going to explore it this morning because it's here in our text. Scripture clearly proclaims that we will rule in the coming kingdom. We see this in many texts, but one was right there in Romans chapter 8, verse 17. It says, now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. You want to share in the glory of God, you share in the sufferings of Christ and you are co-heirs with Christ. Paul also takes the opportunity while the Corinthians were arguing amongst themselves and they couldn't solve their own disputes to tell them, don't you know, this is in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. He says, don't you know that the saints, that's you, that's you, the saints will judge the world? Don't you know the saints will judge the world? And if you're to judge the world, are you not competent to judge these trivial cases, he says? Do you not know that we will judge angels, he says? Whoa, whoa, mind blown, right? Like, whoa, wait a second, Christians are going to sit in judgment over angels? He says, how much more are the things of this life? You can't judge amongst yourselves these trivial matters. How are you going to judge the angels in the time to come, he says. He doesn't tell them this so that they'll get a big head. Okay, and I'm not telling you this so that you'll walk out of here and be like, I can go judge everyone now. That's not the point. That's not the point. The point is to understand that we are different. We have been set apart in Christ. We see glimpses of this royal power on display as Christ teaches his disciples to go out in the Great Commission. What does he tell them in the Great Commission? He says, all authority has been given unto me, therefore go and make disciples. Now, the, the tying of his authority to our making disciples is very important. We go and make disciples in his authority. We have been given authority by him as his vassals, as his ambassadors. And so another responsibility of the king was to go and to fight wars on behalf of the kingdom. Hmm. And I think y'all were talking about this a little bit in Sunday school this morning. That, that Are there any biblical references to believers being engaged in battle, in war? Well, yes, of course there are. Of course there are. Jesus himself said, the gates of hell will not prevail upon the church in Matthew chapter 16. Paul in Ephesians 6 tells us to put on the whole armor of God, the armor of our king. The church is seen tearing down the fortresses and the strongholds of Satan. What a, what a picture 
And it's there because we march forward as the kingdom of God in our king's name. We are made into a royal priesthood. And when we preach the gospel, we go into enemy territory. When we minister to those in depression and those in habitual sins, we trample down enemy ground. We are engaged in a spiritual war and we march forward as ambassadors of our kingdom. But we're not just royal. Okay, That's one side of it. That's one word of the royal priesthood. We're also called priests. Now, what do priests do? And, and I, I want you to get out of your Catholic mindset and don't think of Catholic priests. This isn't a special class of Christian. Okay, you're not, you're a priest and then everybody else are lay people. No, all Christians, everyone who is in Christ is a priest of God. All believers are priests. And this means that we are to have an intimate relationship with God. In the Old Testament, only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. And only one time a year on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur. One of the things that distinguishes us as believers in the New Covenant is that we can walk and live in the presence of God. We live in the presence of God. You have an intimate relationship with God, with the God of the universe. And you're welcomed into His presence. You talk with Him. He talks to you. Okay, this is a, a, a thing only reserved for those who are priests, those who are in this position of, of being in between human and divine. Also, the nation of Israel was called to be a kingdom of priests because when they were in exile in Babylon, God told them to pray for the prosperity of Babylon. That's in Jeremiah chapter 29. We'll get there in a few weeks. Jeremiah chapter 29 says... Pray for the prosperity of Babylon, because when Babylon prospers, you will prosper. And so even though the Israelites were, were sent out of their land, they were no longer in their land, that didn't change their identity. Their identity was still that they were a nation, a kingdom of priests called to intercede on behalf of the nation that they were in, to, to mediate for that nation. And so similarly, where God has placed you, in a nation, in a workplace, in a church, in a family. Those are all places where you should intercede, where you should seek the face of God. To seek the welfare of the place where you are exiled. You are exiles here. We are awaiting the return of our king and a, uh, a new kingdom to be set up in Christ's name. So we pray for the leaders that they would make God-honoring decisions. We pray for the strongholds of sin to be broken in all of those places. And we pray for the light of the gospel to break through. That's the way that we intercede as priests where we are ministering here and now. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 says this. It says, I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior. This is a tremendous task, you guys, to be the priests of God in our daily living. That's a tremendous task, but it is a task that we have been equipped for. In Christ, we are a royal priesthood. And it's the job of the priest, and that is exactly what we are in Christ. Final role of priests before we move on. Priests were also called to teach people. And we see this primarily in, in Ezra. In Ezra, he devoted himself to teaching and studying the law of God. But we as New Testament priests, New Covenant priests, have been commissioned by Jesus, as we saw, in his authority to make disciples and to do what? To baptize them and to teach them everything that Jesus commanded. We, we have been commissioned to be teachers. And that's part of our role as priests. And, and now surely God has equipped some to be teachers. Called some to be teachers. The same way that he's called some to be evangelists and some to be missionaries. Right? That, that is a, a special calling. But it's also something that we each as believers do, all of us do, in our different realms of life. Just because God calls some people to do it professionally or more than others doesn't mean you're off the hook, in other words. This is how I see the teaching aspect of every believer in Christ. We are to learn the Bible. 
We're to learn the Bible. We're to never let it depart from our mouths. We're to talk about it at dinner and read about it at work and talk about it there. Most of the world will never read the Bible, and so they should hear and see the Bible coming out of us all the time. God told Israel in Deuteronomy that the word of God should not depart from their lips. He says this in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. It says, These words that I command you today shall be on your hearts. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit at your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. If you've ever lived, lived in a place where uh, a Jewish family has lived before you, very often you'll find a little uh, you know, phylactery on the doorpost because they take this very literally. They say, you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and you can pull out a little scripture that's right there, written there on the doorpost. They took it literally to wear a phylactery on their forehead or to bind it to their wrist. But Jesus says, you obey in the obvious things of the law, but you don't give your heart to them. They were to speak of the gospel. They were to, to preach the word, to, to speak of the law when they lied down, when they got up, when they walked along the road, when they were in their car, while they waited in line at the supermarket, while they were on the fishing boat or at the golf course, while they were at their work. When you pricked them, they were supposed to bleed scripture. That's the idea that is coming out here in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, remember, these weren't all Levites that Moses is speaking to here in Deuteronomy. They're not all sons of Aaron who held the specific role of priest, but they were all to be a kingdom of priests. And it's the same way for us. Whether you hold the position of teacher or not, you are called as a priest of God to teach. Teach your family. Teach your co-workers. Teach your friends. Let the word of God be on your lips at all times. Is that you? Is that you? As a follower of Christ, you've been anointed as a royal priesthood with all of the rights and responsibilities that come with it. Next, <laughs> Peter defines Christ followers as a holy nation. Oh, and I wanted to go down this road, and I'm not going to. That there's one Christian nation. That's all I'm going to say. And it's this holy nation. Peter defines Christ's followers as a holy nation. Again, this was terminology used of Israel back in Exodus chapter 19, 6. He said they were called a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And being a holy nation didn't mean that they were better than everybody. It didn't mean that they, they could lord it over folks and be holier than thou. They were a holy nation, meaning that they were set apart by God for good works. That's what being holy means. Set apart to serve Him. Set apart to worship Him. And in the same way, we have been chosen by Christ and set apart for good works unto Him that God may receive the glory in all things. This separates us from the world. Look at the way that Paul says it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. He says that believers are God's workmanship. God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand for us to do. In Scripture, you will find many more objects referred to as holy than you will people. Now, think about all of the implements and utensils and things that were used in the temple. Those things were, were holy. The temple itself was declared to be holy. Why? Because it was created that way. It was made for a specific purpose, set apart. You, you didn't walk into the temple to go get a sandwich. It was made for a specific purpose of worship. And service unto God. And we too have been created holy. Paul says it here that we are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. We are his workmanship. The word here for workmanship is literally poem. Poema. We are God's poem. We're his masterpiece. He has created us carefully crafting and constructing us through various events and teachings and even trials. In order to produce good works in us for His glory. That's who we are. God chose to make us holy. He chose to display His glory, His character, His good works in us to the rest of the world. Now holiness has that positive element of 
doing good works of righteousness, right? But it's also got a, a negative element of saying that we stay away from the world, that we are unstained from the pollution of sin. That's the other side of holiness. See it in James chapter 1, verse 27. James says this, Religion that, the God, that, that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, that's the positive side of doing good works. And here's the negative side. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. The church is a holy nation. It is set apart from sin, set apart for the purpose of good works. So the question is, are, are you staying unspotted, unpolluted from the world and the things of this world? Are you practicing a faith that helps you serve others, especially the less fortunate? I'm afraid that there's a lot of Christians today that have a religion that doesn't create holiness in their lives. That doesn't bring about holiness. It, it essentially makes no difference for them or for anybody else. It's simply something they believe. And it does nothing. And I'm afraid that that's a religion that our God does not accept, according to James. However, that does bring up a great point here. That none of these things that we've talked about, none of these things are of our own doing. I can't hear the gospel and just make a decision to be a chosen race or a royal priesthood or a holy nation. These are all gifts of God's grace. They are things that He has brought about in my heart and life. They are all tied as well to the last of these first four descriptors that Peter uses to define believers. Finally here, the, the last one in verse 9, Peter declares that the church is a people for God's own possession. People for God's own possession. And again, this is something that was said about Israel. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. It says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be His people, His treasured possession. Wow! You are God's treasured possession in Christ Jesus. Well, what does that mean? What is, think about your most treasured possession. What is it about that that makes you hold on to it? Why do you hold on to your most treasured possession? And I want you to think deeper than the sentimental value that's there. I want you to think deeper than the, the intrinsic value that might be present in it. Because God doesn't have needs the way that we do. He needs nothing. He's got no uh, emptiness to fill up with a possession. I think if you look deeper, you're going to find that the reason why you consider something your treasured possession is because it brings you joy. It brings you great joy. You, you are satisfied in it. This was the whole basis. I don't know if you remember back a, a few years ago, Marie Kondo, who would you know, go into her closet and she'd be like, look at everything in my closet. I'm going to pull out this shirt and let me hold it up. And does it spark joy in me? If it doesn't, I'm going to throw it away and I'm going to only keep the things that spark joy. There's real problems with that philosophy. We don't have time to go down that rabbit trail. But it, it reminds me of this idea. It, it makes me shine some light here on the part of being God's treasured possession. It isn't about how much God needs me or how much he, he derives value from me. Rather, being God's treasured possession means that we are here for His pleasure. We are created for His pleasure. He chose us in Him for His joy and His pleasure. Now that, again, must have been a phenomenal idea for these persecuted believers to hear in Peter's letter. And I hope it changes the way, if you really hear it, I hope it changes the way that you look at yourself in the mirror. Because if you understand this, if, if you get this, these young believers were mocked, they were abused, they were rejected by the world. But Peter tells them that in Christ they are owned and treasured by God. It's so important for us to know how treasured we are by our Heavenly Father. Because if we don't, then we have the tendency to do one of two things. We either accept the mindset of the world about us, that we're you know weird and crazy and don't know what we're talking about and we're uneducated and all of those things, and we just accept that. We accept what the world says about us instead of what God says about us. 
Or we respond with pride and arrogance and we boastfully step up and say, no, we aren't those things. Let me show you better. Neither of those are what God has called us to. He says, you are my treasured possession. You don't derive your value from what people say about you or from how much you can boast about yourself. You derive your value from the fact that I love you. Whoa. And that is so great. It pushes back on our pride and our arrogance. It pushes back on our, our, our lack of self-esteem. It's crucial for us to know that we are chosen as God's special possession in the earth. Not because we are so great, but because He is so great. We also see this reality taught in the book of Ephesians. I know we're going to Ephesians a lot. We're going to Ephesians and Deuteronomy a lot because they both talk about all the same things here. Look at what Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 says. Paul says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I want you to hear that last phrase, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. I've read that so many times and read it in my mind as I am rich because of my glorious inheritance in God. That's the way it just kind of runs through in my mind. That, oh, I have an inheritance in God and I'm richer because of it. But that's not what it says. Well, that's not what it says here. Paul prays that their eyes may be enlightened to know the riches of God's glorious inheritance in us, in the saints. It's interesting, you would think that he would say our inheritance in God, meaning how special he is to us, how rich we are in him, but Paul instead says God's glorious inheritance in the saints. In other words, we are his wealth. We are his pleasure. Powerful concept for you to grasp. And, and, God, and Paul prays for the church to grasp it. Go over to the Old Testament. Look in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. See what Zephaniah 3, 17 says about the people of God. It says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. And a lot of them stop right there. Yeah, he's mighty to save. Great. Got my salvation. It's all set. Keep going. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Zephaniah talks about the people of God in language that we're not often used to hearing. He says that God takes great delight in us. He rejoices over us. He sings over us. That is a phenomenal concept. That we are God's inheritance. His own treasured possession. This is something that I have struggled to understand. But I think I've, I've started to understand it a bit more now that I've become a, a, a father of teenagers and I've grown up with kids. Typically, your possessions are used, as I already said, to bring you joy. You know, your TV, your internet, your you know, pets, your family, your friends, whatever. But God, who is independent, God who needs nothing, chose to create us for his pleasure. He, he chose freely to create you, not because he needed you, but because he wanted you. What a difference. You are his treasured possession, and he gets great joy over you. Primarily, mostly, he gets great joy of you, over you when you imitate him well. We were created in God's image. Right? Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. And God gets the most glory when we live in his image. When we display our father to a watching world. You see, this is teaching that you are not only made to enjoy God. You were made to enjoy God. That is 100% true. You were to enjoy God in your life. But you were also made so that God could enjoy you. Whoa. That, if that doesn't blow you away, I hope that you get this. I pray that you could understand this, that the eyes of your heart might be open to see it. Because if you see it, when you look in the mirror, it will release you from your fears and your insecurities. If you see who you are to your Heavenly Father. The world says you're too short, 
It says you're too tall. It says you're not smart enough. It says you're not a good enough leader. It says you're not a, a great enough speaker. You're not wealthy enough. God says, no, you are perfect. You are perfect because you were created in His image. And any of those things that the world considers lesser things, weaknesses, He uses them for His glory. When he takes what the world considers to be foolish and confounds the wise. When he takes the things that the world considers to be weak and defeats the strong. You are God's chosen possession. And he prays that you would grasp this. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that passes all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So when you understand how much God loves you, when you truly comprehend it, it will change you. You will be filled with His fullness, transformed by His grace. So... I hope that we will pray this as well for ourselves, that we may have power to grasp this idea. This is life-changing. These persecuted believers needed to understand this, and so do we. So do we, brothers and sisters. Right, the last two identifiers in verse 10 come as a package deal. They come as a package. Let's read it together. This is verse 10. It says, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once... You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, if your ears don't perk up and make you think of Hosea, I want you to go home. You've got homework tonight. Go home and read Hosea chapters 1 and 2 at least. Okay, I'm going to give you a quick overview of it so you can see what Peter is referring to. But I want you to read it for yourself because it's powerful. It is a beautiful picture to help you understand the love of that God has for you and the love that he has put on display in the life of this prophet Hosea. I'll tell you the story. So it begins, the basic premise is that Hosea, this prophet, is a picture of God himself. He's a picture of God himself. And God commands Hosea, go and take a wife of harlotry. Go and find a wife who will never be faithful to you. And he finds her. We meet this promiscuous woman, Gomer. He obeys this command and he marries her. And quickly she begins to have children. But these aren't Hosea's children. These are children of her promiscuity. And they receive names. And two of these children's names are very significant. Hear them. The first one is named Lo-Ami, which means not my people. The second is named Lo-Ruhama, which means no mercy. You will not receive mercy. Gomer continues on in her sin, and, Ho and Hosea loses her. She goes back to her paramour, and she gets sold into slavery. She's up on the, on the block for auction. And God says, go and love her again. <laughs> Hosea takes everything that he has. And he goes and he buys back this faithless woman and loves her. And God in his great mercy, in his infinite mercy, in the end of chapter 2, this is what he says. This is Hosea chapter 2 verse 23. He says, I will sow her for myself in the land. And here he's not referring to Gomer, he's referring to his people. He says, I myself will sow her in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy, on low rubama. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he will say, you are my God. What a picture. What a picture of who we are in Christ. That we are the faithless bride that he has chased down with his love. And he has made us his people. He has bought us back from the auction block. He has brought us out of darkness and into his glorious light. For his glory and not for ours. We have nothing to glory in in that. Gomer had nothing to brag about. 
except for her husband. <laughs> he loves me. That's it. That's all we get to boast about is that Christ loves us. He loves us despite ourselves. Amen. Peter here is alluding to a beautiful picture of what happens in our life with Christ. We were dead in our trespasses and our sins. We were lost in the darkness, he says. We were not God's people. We were by nature children of wrath. God had no reason to show us his mercy. We spat on his face. We cheated on him with our infidelity and our idolatry. We worshipped other gods and he would have been completely justified to leave us in our darkness with no hope, enslaved. Completely justified. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ Jesus. He made us alive in Christ. He brought us out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. He richly poured out his mercy and forgave us of all of our sins. He gave his own son to purchase us back from slavery. And he doesn't just leave us there on the auction block. He doesn't just say, okay, you're free, now go about your business. No, he weds us to himself in love. He takes us from slavery and he gives us a new name. He gives us a new identity. And he calls us his people. Oh, that's a wonderful truth, but... If you're like me, it leads you to ask the question, why? Why me? Why, why, God? Why would you do this? It echoes Psalm chapter 8, where the psalmist there said, What is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You've made him a little lower than the angels. Well, why? You've crowned him with glory, but, but for what reason? What purpose? Why would God choose to lavish his love on sinners like us? And the most obvious answer we've already discussed. And it's not good enough for a lot of people. They want to keep digging further. But the most obvious answer is that he did it because he chose to. Because he wanted to. Because it gave him great joy to love you. But there is another reason that's listed here in 1 Peter. One more reason that Peter gives at the end of verse 9. I want to look at it as we close. Why does God make us into a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession who have been shown mercy and declared to be his people? Peter says at the end of verse 9, So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. You've got one job to do as a Christian, and it's this. You've got one job to do as a Christian. You don't have to make yourself a chosen race. God has already done that for you in Christ. You can't work your way into being a royal priesthood. You are appointed to that position by the God who has saved you in Jesus Christ. You don't, through your own efforts and good works, make yourself into a holy nation. You are created that way by your God. And you can't earn your way into being God's treasured possession. No. He chose you and He keeps you because you bring Him great joy. You have one job as a Christian and it is to proclaim His excellencies. That's what you were made for. That's why Adam and Eve were created in God's image. It was to declare His excellency, to display, to image His character. God has purchased and purified a people for Himself to the praise of His glorious grace. And that's us. That's you if you are in Christ today. Have you ever thought about the fact that when we gather for worship, this worship isn't for us. It's not something that we are supposed to get something out of. Nor is it something that we do for God. We're not serving God. God doesn't need our worship. He's not served by human hands as though He needed anything. Since He Himself gives all men, life and breath and everything. Amen. So why do we worship? We worship because we were made to worship. It's the goal of our lives. It's the purpose of our lives. It's the goal of all of God's creation. To worship Him. So this week, when you're wondering, what's God's will for my life? What, is God, what does God want me to do? You've got one job as a Christian. This is God's will for you in Christ. That you would remember that it's God's will for you to proclaim His excellencies. He has done everything 
to enable you to proclaim His excellencies to a watching world. You might think, I can't do that. What if people think I'm weird? What if people look at me strange? Or what, what, if, what if I get in trouble for doing it? If you get stuck, if you get stuck, I want you to think on Christ this week. I want you to think on Christ. I want you to think of what He did to purchase your freedom. How He purposed with the Father from time immemorial. From the foundation of the world to redeem you from the darkness and into His light. I want you to think on His love for you. And think of the joy that you bring to His heart. Not because of who you are, but because of who you are in Christ. And then I want you to proclaim His excellencies. Without fear. Because you serve a great God. And you are members of a, a different kingdom. A kingdom of priests, a holy nation. I pray that you know God the way I do. I pray that you know Christ the way I do. That the way Peter describes you. If you don't, if you've never surrendered to Jesus and stopped all of your religious striving, then come. Come today. He's ready. He's ready to pour out His grace and His mercy upon you and to make you His own today. Let's pray. Father God, You are our King. We worship You. You, you have given us all things in Christ. You have lavished on us the, the blessings and the riches of Your heavenly kingdom. And God, we, we collapse under the weight of glory. God, you have showered your riches on us, and we, we don't know what to do but return praise and glory to your name. We worship you, not because of what we have received, but because you love us. You have made us into something of great worth because of your love. All things come from you and return to you, and we seek to return your praise and your glory back to you because we recognize that we're not worth it until you say that we are worth it. And you have shown our worth in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for our new life in Christ. All the things that you have made us in Christ. And we ask that you would give us the strength to know these things. To understand these things. And not just to know them with our head. But to live them with our lives. To walk forward out of this place. Recognizing all of these things are true for us in Christ. And if they're true for us in this room, they are true for us in our workplace. They're true for us in the grocery store, at the river, wherever we are. That we exist to proclaim the excellencies of your name. That we live to show a watching and waiting world, a dark and dying, sinful world, the light in Christ. Help us, oh God. Help us to do it in Jesus' name. Amen.